Well, welcome and thank you for uh, being willing to meet virtually uh, for this meeting. I certainly wish we were together in St. Louis to uh, share this work and field your questions and answers, but we'll have to do the best we can uh, given our pandemic and I appreciate your engagement. My disclosures are listed here, disclosed in the paperwork for the meeting as well. And now give this. What I want to talk about is several of the really important challenges that we face in trying to get genomics up and running in medicine. And, you know, it's fascinating that one of the cruxes of the problem really is the fact that we are so darned adaptable. It's really our strength and it's our weakness. And the way that it's a weakness is hard to recognize, but I want to give a dramatic example in order to drive this point home. So here is a man who was diagnosed with colon cancer at 39 years of age and died four years later. You will, may know him well as Chadwick Bozeman. Now, I certainly am not aware of Mr. Bozeman's uh, medical situation personally, and it may not be the case that he had a familial uh, form of early onset colon cancer, but it's a well-known example, and I want to use it to grab your attention here. And the problem with our adaptability is our common to these things is to say something like these kinds of unfortunate things happen. And that's because as human beings, we have adapted too well to the idea that this very unfortunate thing has not in the past really been preventable. It isn't, wasn't practical in years past to start screening people in their 30s for colon cancer. The cost benefit just wasn't there prior to genomics. But it's not really the same anymore. And unfortunately, our adaptability has allowed us to become comfortable with this really lousy situation that causes people in their 30s to get and then soon thereafter die of cancer when in fact those things can be prevented. Another crux of the problem is that we are absolutely terrified of the unknown and novel risks. And you know, characterize, I really love this quote. It's called uh, one fear to rule them all, one fear to find them, one fear to bring them all and in the black box bind them. It's a quote. Um, from J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, and really the fear of the unknown terrifies human beings. And unfortunately for most people, genomics is the unknown in medicine and we are afraid of it. And more recent um, update on this is a, a psychologist by the name of uh, R. Nicholas Carlton a few years ago really laid it out plain and simple, is that fear of the unknown may be a, or possibly the fundamental fear that humans dread. And it causes us to behave irrationally and to do things that really aren't in our best interests because we are afraid of the unknown. So what the heck is going on here? Genomics is new. There's no two ways about it. It's a new technology and there are some unknown risks. And wow, there have been a number of things that have been raised about genomics. Uh, fear of discrimination, fear of patient distress. That is when you tell a patient that you might have Lynch syndrome and your family's at risk, that the patients will be inconsolably disturbed by that. There's a fear out there of eugenics that we shouldn't be doing this because of the bad, bad racial genetics and uh, disease genetics that was pa uh, practiced at the beginning of the last, uh, early part of the last century. A ridiculous fear of genetic determinism, which I want to dive into uh, really uh, in a deep way here in this lecture. And a fear, uh, certainly on the part of providers, of a loss of mastery. Providers do not like 
be in situations where they're in front of a patient and there might be something happening genomics that's going on in a way that they may not completely understand and they don't like not being in charge and being the most knowledgeable and completely up-to-date provider that there could be. I could go on. There are fears of many things that prevent us from being able to do this. And really, what we have to do is think about these uh, fears and what is it that is really preventing us from using genomics to screen for susceptibility of disease in order to find these people who are at these very elevated risks and implement prevention strategies that we know are effective. Things like colonoscopy screening annually for people with Lynch syndrome and related disorders. We know that works. It's not a question anymore. And the key barrier here is really an irrational fear of genomics. And what's so disturbing about this is to frame it in a way that these hypothetical irrational fears of the unknown should not overcome the very real imperative to alleviate suffering and death from what we know is severe and early onset colon cancer. And in this, in a very perverse way, these hypothetical irrational fears of the unknown have overwhelmed what we've gotten used to, which is people suffering and dying from preventable disease. And that's irrational for us to be in that pickle. Now, I don't want to exaggerate here, and it is absolutely not the case that most people with colon cancer have Lynch syndrome. You all know that's not true. But a lot of people do have hereditary susceptibility to early onset cancer. It is present in lots of families, and most of the people who have it don't know they have it. And we need to tackle this problem with a rational analysis and make the tough trade-offs that are necessary to implement this and make it happen in spite of our fears and recognizing the fact that we've just gotten too used to people suffering and dying from these diseases. And what is this about the unknown of genomics that really bothers people? It's actually kind of odd because genetic testing, genomic testing is just another test. Now there's been lots of stuff in the popular media about how genetic and genomic testing can tell you your future and how your genes will tell you what you will be and what will happen and on and on and on. It's not true both fortunately and unfortunate. Genetic testing is not a perfect predictor of disease, just like any other test you use in medicine is not perfectly correlated with the diagnosis of a disease. There are many things between a variant being determined to be associated with the disease and a phenotype, a pathophysiologic mechanism of disease, many things in between those two things and there is not a one-to-one -one, if you have a variant you're going to die of this disease nonsense it's not true so genetic testing is not fate it is not deterministic it's like every other test that you can order from the lab it's incredibly useful it can provide you with helpful information to optimize how you manage your patient and you can use it to reduce suffering and death from disease now, genomics is a young science, and so you could say, we just don't know enough yet to do this. You know, I hear that a lot, and like many things of this nature, there's a grain of truth to it, and there isn't. There is a lot that we still don't know about genomics. But this is mostly a bogus strategy akin to how public relations work, uh, not really conceptually any different from how big tobacco delayed regulation of smoking smoking products or how currently uh, big oil corporations are delaying alternative energy. These are models for how you, de you delay change when it's in your self-interest to do so. 
And I don't really think we as a profession want to adopt this model for how we should think about genomics in healthcare. So how should we think about it? We have to define a pragmatic approach to what we are needing to do for our patients. We have to be able to contextualize available knowledge into the clinical setting of today. We have to bring genomics into the clinical reality of the practice of medicine. And that is not what any of us want it to be. It's, it's not the ivory tower and it is not the ideal or the perfect. It is what is the achievable. What can we do with the information we have for the patient who's in front of us? And as you all know, you have to make decisions. And your only choice here with genomics is you can use this imperfect science and knowledge base that we call genomics with its incomplete data, or you can choose to be completely ignorant of it. That's your only choice. There is no choice of or you can practice the ideal because it doesn't exist and it won't for a very, very long time, if ever. Now, these are certainly not new concepts. This has been around for a long time. Those of you who might uh, be able to read the Latin uh, might recognize this. And uh, I don't know, I, I didn't know this myself. Uh, this gentleman, uh, Francois Marie Arret, um, actually his uh, pen name was Voltaire. And the Latin saying uh, is, the best is inimical to the good or as we have understood it today, uh, the perfect is the enemy of the good. So this is an old concept that's been around for centuries, and it is an important one that we have to acknowledge to make progress and move forward in the face of uncertainty and in the face of incomplete knowledge. Of this, I just love this. This is from a Nobel Prize uh, speech uh, on economics actually, is that decision makers can satisfy, and this is a, a word uh, he framed, uh, which is a hybrid word between satisfy and suffice. Uh, decision makers can satisfy either by finding optimum solutions for a simplified world or by finding satisfactory solutions for a more realistic world. Of course, he's talking about economic models, uh, etc. But it applies perfectly to us because we are practicing in a very real world of medical health care, where there is incomplete knowledge in every aspect of what we do. And we still have to satisfy the scenario in order to best take care of our patients. So I mentioned the word uncertainty a few minutes ago, and there is plenty of it to go around. Um, a group of us actually sat down and assembled uh, a model for what we think uncertainty comprises in genomics. And what's really interesting about it is uh, how many different of it there are. Here's a zoom in for you. And there's lots of different parts of it. And what's pretty amazing is given all these different components of uncertainty that could exist, that it works at all, but it does, which tells you again, it's a practical and pragmatic tool in spite of the fact that our knowledge is incomplete uh, and uncertain. So are we alone in this? Are, there, are these genomics people totally out to sea uh, and uh, fuzzy about their science in contrast to how it's done in all the rest of medicine? Not hardly at all. Uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Bob Nussbaum, uh, brought this study to my attention. And this was a uh, study on interpreting path slides, histopath slides uh, for uh, breast cancer. And it was a study designed to take a, a hundred, have 115 practicing pathologists review 240 breast biopsy slides. And what's super interesting here, I love this part of it just to start with, is of course you have to compare what they say to something with some ground level truth. And unfortunately in pathology, it actually doesn't seem to exist. And so all the best they could do was define what they call the consensus derived reference, which is two or 
our three out of three pathologists, expert pathologists that they had selected for these 240 slides, decided what truth was, and that's just the best they could do. Interesting little observation. But then they took these 240 slides and passed them out to these practicing pathologists and asked them to and measured their concordance rate and their discordance rate. And it was not small. Um, the, the concordance rate, uh, the discordance rate, excuse me, was not small. Um, you can see here um, the biggest problem, the biggest challenge they had was in, of course, atypia, which is this middle range of findings where it's pretty hard to decide whether it should be called atypia or whether it is a low-grade uh, malignancy. Um, it's just a hard subjective judgment to make. And you can see that there's only half, there's only 50% agreement uh, about atypia across these 115 pathologists, a pretty startling discordance. So the overall concordance per slide was 75%. Which is to say, when you receive that histopath interpretation from your friendly local pathologist, you need to remember that there's only a 75% chance that what they say it is matches what it actually is. A really important thing to think about when you're deciding what to do with your patient. Even more interesting is uncertainty at another level. This might surprise you, but it actually turns out that between a half and two and a half histology reports are actually not valid because they're the result from some other patient. I want to say that again. There's a between a two and a half and a five percent chance that that biopsy result that you got back on your patient isn't from your patient at all. There's been an upstream swap somewhere in the information system or in the clinical pathology physical handling of the slides process or the dictation notes or whatever that causes your result to be from some other patient. That is not that small of a number. So when things don't match, you have to ask yourself hard questions and make sure that you consider the fact of these, not only the uncertainty of the subjectivity of the interpretation of the pathology, but is it even your patient's result in the first place? Really a, a startling um, uh, revelation. So variant interpretation in genomics has the exact same problem. It's no different at all from pathology and uh, histopathology. And we have, it's very different in its uh, specifics, but conceptually it's the same. Our input, uh, it, it depends on the scale of the testing that you're doing, uh, from a handful of variants up to millions of variants if the patient is undergoing something like a genome sequence. And what the clinical molecular um, uh, geneticist has to do with that result is take in that a myriad of variant attributes associated with uh, relevant variants in that person's test set, uh, prior observations of that variant, presentation of the current case, etc. Integrate that into a probabilistic uh, assessment, which is an assertion of the probability of pathogenicity of the variant. And what that really is doing is saying, I'm telling you, doctor, that with X confidence, I think this variant is related or causes this disease. And so um, docs uh, mostly want yes, no answers or categorical answers to things. They don't want numeric. So recognizing that the American College of Medical Genetics adapted the scale that was developed by the IARC into a five level scale of pathogenicity ranging from pathogenic on the left to likely pathogenic, to variant of uncertain significance, likely benign or benign. And what those labels represent, and you can see the numerical values on the scale there, what those labels represent, again, is that assertion of the probability of pathogenicity, which is above 99% for pathogenic, or at the opposite end, less than 1 or 0.1% for benign. And so this probability of pathogenicity represents what would be formally called a pseudo-quantitative, non-linear, asymmetric categorical assessment of the likelihood of pathogenicity. And it really is a helpful scale because 
it does fit with how humans make decision, which is human decision making is almost always about dichotomization. Yes, no, normal, abnormal, pathologic, benign, healthy, sick, etc. We dichotomize things. That's how our brains work. We are uh, computational dichotomizing machines. We take in huge amounts of input every day in everything we do, and we divide things into two categories. That's how brains work. So the ACMG took that um, basic model and uh, took all of the various uh, categories of evidence and uh, organized them into categories, both for and against pathogenicity, tried to relatively weight them, and then combine them into the pseudo-quantitative likelihood. And so the um, groups, there's uh, seven groups of data you can see on the left axis uh, of this table. And then the six columns represent uh, the different uh, strengths of evidence. And on the pathogenic side, there's four strengths of evidence going from supporting moderate, strong, very strong. And on the benign side, there's just two supporting and strong. And then you take these various rules and which each variant has. And then these are what we call the combining rules. And you take those various attributes of a variant and you say, oh, if you have one very strong and one strong, that means your variant is pathogenic and that we think it's 99% likely. Now, what's super interesting about this is that this is a group of experts who were, what they were really doing was reducing to black and white uh, to a, um, a, a written uh, formal structure, what was then mostly considered an art of variant interpretation, and using their best clinical judgment to define what the categories were, relatively weight them, and figure out these combining rules. And it worked pretty darn well. Um, and it's been uh, really a boon to clinical molecular genetics practice and has led to increased uniformity of variant interpretation or classification across laboratories. So a success in every realm. Then along came a group of us who looked at these rules and said to ourselves, you know, what's peculiar about these rules that you guys came up with is that they seem to be following a fundamental mathematical principle that was uh, enunciated by this gentleman. I don't know if any of you recognize this woodcut, but this woodcut is probably, no, not that base. This one. This is probably a woodcut of the Reverend Thomas Bayes, who was an English minister, who came up with the formulation that is shown in this beautiful uh, neon sign. Um, I, I'm terribly envious of this neon sign. I really would love to have one of these in my office. Um, and uh, it really worked out an incredibly fundamental, profound, and in the end, incredibly simple and obvious mathematical principle. So that the Reverend actually said. So what he said is, written here in the equation, and it says that the probability of some event A occurring, given that B has occurred, is equal to the probability of B occurring if A occurs, multiplied by the likelihood of A, all divided by the likelihood or probability of B. And you're now scratching your head and saying, I, you know, I hate formulas, I hate math, I practice medicine, I don't want to do this. What is this really? And what's fundamentally about is that in the Bayesian view of probabilistic reasoning, a Bayesian probability or interpretation measures the degree of belief in a proposition before and after accounting for a piece of evidence that has an effect on that probability. And what should, uh, hopefully a, a bells are starting to ring or lights are starting to go off in your head and you say, wait a minute, that's, that's what we do every day 
with every single piece of clinical data that we gather on every single patient. And you're right. And the, what the brilliance of Reverend Bayes' uh, insight was is that he reduced that to a mathematical formula and you can quantitate this. It's very straightforward to do. This isn't is what most of us were taught in our statistics courses in college or maybe if you're lucky in medical school you got some statistics which is the so-called frequentist or name and Pearson statistics. And this is the statistics that we do when we say, oh, I want to design an experiment. I'm going to figure out how many samples I need to evaluate. I'm going to do a power analysis to power my clinical trial. And then when I do it, I'm going to take my cases and my controls and I'm going to measure p-values. That's all frequentist statistics. It's not Bayesian statistics. And frequentist statistics are a fundamental and essential part of good science if done properly, but they're useless when you reduce the scientific problem to an N of 1. Frequentist statistics have nothing to say when you have one sample. Internists do this every day. And a patient walks into a clinic and, you know, it should occur to the internist, what's the incidence of colon cancer in this 50-year-old patient who really I don't know that much else about? Well, you can derive uh, from the literature a baseline incidence of the general population frequency of colon cancer in 50-year-olds. And that would give you a ballpark estimate of what this patient's likelihood is of having cancer. But then what do you do? You ask uh, the patient a couple of questions. Let's say uh, you might ask him, what are your stools? And he tells you, oh, my stools are kind of sticky, tarry, and black. Then you say to yourself, oh, now how likely is colon cancer in this 50-year-old man if he says his stools are tarry? What you just did is Bayesian reasoning. You evaluated the uh, degree of belief in a proposition, i.e., does this patient, have, this patient have colon cancer? That's a proposition. Before you had a piece of evidence, you knew it was such and such a frequency. After a piece of evidence, you know he has tarry stools. It has a different frequency. His frequency, his likelihood or uh, probability of having colon cancer just went up. That is Bayesian. And what we figured out is that what these clinical molecular geneticists were doing was exactly the same thing. They were taking a variant that they didn't know much about that has a prior probability of pathogenicity. They took a whole bunch of evidence. Here's all the different kinds of evidence that you could apply to. And then they combined those and then assign a variant uh, a, path, a degree of pathogenicity. So this is the process that we have now formalized that is a Bayesian quantitative approach to variant interpretation. So we assign a variant of prior probability of pathogenicity, which is somewhat dependent on how many variants you're looking at. It's not directly dependent on the ascertainment or the phenotype of the patient. It's a really important and off confused point. And you modify that with conditional probabilities, population frequencies, bioinformatics, functional assays, prior reports, etc. And then you can calculate what the posterior probability of pathogenicity is for that variant. So if we were to take this process that these geneticists have told us that that's what they do and write it in terms of what the reverend would say, this is what the reverend would say. He would say that the probability of pathogenicity of the variant, given the evidence that you have about that variant, is equal to the probability of the evidence being observed if the variant is pathogenic times the overall probability or, or um, likelihood of pathogenic variants divided by the, the frequency or the likelihood of that kind of evidence. And you can derive the pathogenicity and then take your various um, kinds of evidence and you can, this equation allows you to scale them by uh, dividing them by one, two, four, or eight, adding or adding for positive, subtracting for benign criteria, and then calculate a posterior probability uh, of. So the beauty of this is these attributes uh, are fundamentally Bayesian. They reflect 
not only a fundamental mathematical principle of n of 1 probability, but they reflect real clinical decision making. This is how all of you who do good clinical care take care of your patients. You use the Reverend Bayes formula every day, either implicitly or explicitly. The beauty of it is once you formalize the structure, then this is all, uh, much of it is, I should say, automatable. Allows a lot of these attributes to be collected and uh, coded and calculated by a computer. And you can then recalculate things on the fly as data are updated or you have additional conditional probabilities about your variant. And it's also completely transparent because you know what all of the factors are. You can begin to separate uh, evidence into uh, other more refined categories, refine your estimates, and reevaluate your risk to your patient. Oh, so, okay, I've taken you down a bit of a, um, a probabilistic rabbit hole. And so now the clinicians in the audience are wondering, what on earth am I supposed to do with this genomic test report? And the key thing I want to get across at this juncture is that the pathogenicity classification of the variant is not the answer. It's the starting point. That probability of pathogenicity of that variant is not the likelihood that your patient has this disease. It's the starting point. So again, the probability of pathogenicity of the variant is not the probability of the correctness of the diagnosis of the patient. Labs assess pathogenicity of the variant. Clinicians make diagnoses. The doctor's job, the clinician's job, is to make what we call a clinical molecular diagnosis in the patient, taking into account the variant and the patient's presentation. Now what do you think about the patient? Again, and reasoning. And here, context matters enormously. And you've had, I'm sure, during your training, uh, questions like this. And I'm going to bring it into a genomics context. So uh, I'm going to use that genomic, classic genomics or genetics clinic example. A young man presents for a checkup, and the clinician notes that he has some facial and skeletal features of a disease called Marfan syndrome, which some of you may be familiar with. Doesn't have a family history of Marfan syndrome, but the clinician's a little worried, and so she orders an echocardiogram on him, and they measure his aortic roots at the 95th centile for his age. So it's enlarged, borderline enlarged, and she looks him over and looks at this echo report and thinks, this guy, I think there's a three out of four chance that this guy has Marfan syndrome. Okay, so... She orders a exome sequence on this guy, a broad test, but it's uh, perfectly defensible. And it returns a pathogenic variant in the gene called FBN1. Now, what we know about testing for this disease is that in patients with known Marfan syndrome, a pathogenic variant is detected in about 70% of patients. And here's what's important. In people without Marfan syndrome, you can expect to get a false positive result of a pathogenic FBN1 variant in about one out of a thousand patients. Because as I said earlier, genetic and genomic testing isn't perfect. It's probabilistic. There is no such thing as genetic determinism. It's just a medical test, no different from a hemoglobin conceptually with respect to this calculation. So here, now we know what the sensitivity of the test is, is 70%. We know what the false positive rate is, about 0.1%. What's the likelihood that this patient has? Well, if you do the calculations, it actually turns out to be 99.8% likely. Awesome, right? That's way above the threshold of practical clinical certainty. Confirmed her suspicions of her patient's features. He should be managed. Now let's do version two of the scenario. Here I'm going to invoke a pediatrician who orders an exome on a toddler with autism. And no variant for the autism is identified, but there is a secondary finding of a pathogenic variant in that same gene, FBN1. The clinician scratches her head and says, wow, you know, this kiddo, I was worried about autism, but I didn't think this wasn't thinking anything about Marfan syndrome in him, and there's no relationship between Marfan syndrome and autism. Now, unfortunately, this kiddo is an adoptee, so we don't have any family history. What's the likelihood this, this toddler has Marfan syndrome? If you do the same calculation uh, that I proposed in the last patient, the answer here is 
8%. And remember, this is the same genomic test result that the first patient had. had. What is going on here? Genomic and genetic testing is just like any other disease, any other test. It is enormously dependent on the context in which you apply the test. And in a diagnostic setting, it tells you more than it does in a screening setting because of the prior processes. You can put this in the context of a visual, if you will. So here's our first scenario where there's a 75% likelihood that the patient was affected. So the blue square is three times the size of the orange square. And here's how my test performs. Um, about 70% positive um, in the affecteds and 0.1%, my little square is probably a little bit large there, but you get the idea. The very small number of the unaffecteds, 0.1%, uh, um, have a test positive result. And so when you're looking at your test result, you're trying to look at the fraction of this, which is of the people who test positive who actually has the disease. So that's the big light blue box divided by the big light blue box plus that little tiny blue speck, which is the positives from the unaffected. So a big number over a big number plus a tiny number is just about one. That's our 99.8% number we saw earlier. So that, that's but now when we switch to a screening context with the exact same test and the same test result, here's what it gives us. So our affected, our number of affecteds in the population when we're doing screening is tiny. It's nowhere near 75%. It's probably in Marfan syndrome about one in 7,000 people. So when you're testing a randomly selected population, your prior probability plummets. You guys still get 70% of them have a positive test. So now you can see my little blue rectangle in there. Uh, but now your unaffected is almost the whole shebang here. And you're still getting 0.1%, but your unaffected are even bigger than they were before. And so 0.1%, because almost everybody's unaffected uh, of the unaffected, gets to be a bigger number. So then you take your light blue rectangle over your light blue rectangle plus your a dark blue rectangle and the dark blue rectangle is bigger now uh, and the light blue rectangle is tiny and so now your uh, answer is a much smaller fraction eight percent is how it actually calculates and you can see why because that uh, blue rectangle plummets in size and the dark blue the light blue rectangle plummets in size and that dark blue one stays or uh, gets bigger so a rational approach to genomic screening is that, of course, no screening test is perfect. That's what Voltaire told us in the 1700s. The perfect is the enemy of the good. Genomic testing is good. It is not perfect. What we have to do is make an objective assessment on our trade-offs. And the trade-off here is a pretty simple one. It's a really hard judgment to make, but it's simple. What we have to trade off is sensitivity versus false positive rate. That is, we have to decide what fraction of the population when we're applying genomic screening we want to be able to detect and what level of false positives we are willing to accept to accomplish that. It's a tough trade-off, um, but it isn't impossible to do. And this exact trade-off is something those of you who do pediatric cancer are very well familiar with this. The exact trade-off is what has been made in newborn screening testing. All the newborns get a heel prick on the first day of life, and a set of tests are done to identify a rare genetic diseases. And the objective trade-off that was made there is they wanted to preserve sensitivity and they were willing to sacrifice the false positive rate. So, Newborn screening works well, has a high sensitivity at the cost of a relatively high fraction of false positives. That is, people who test positive, babies who test positive in the screen, turn out upon further evaluation to not have the disease that the screen test indicated. It's exactly how screening works, how all diagnostic tests work, and it's exactly how genomic testing works.
So we want to do population screening. We need to apply that uh, genomic screen to the population after we have calibrated our, our desired um, variables for sensitivity and false positive rate. And then the key thing is, and this is the one of the big cruxes of the whole matter, is we have to be prepared to do the post hoc phenotyping for cancer susceptibility genomic screening just like we have done for newborn screening. That is, the test screen comes back positive. Then the clinician's challenge is to determine, is this person truly at risk or not? And we want to develop a new set of skills and practices. These are just a different mix of the things that all of you very well know how to do, which is to think, if I have a positive test result, how do I confirm or refute that the patient has the disease, which is different than what you've been doing in the past. What genomics has done is really turned um, general uh, approach to medical practice on its head. It used to be our main challenge in genetic testing was how to select the test. We had these incredible, and these still exist um, in, in CCN guidelines and others about the all the criteria that a family or an individual has to manifest before you order a genetic test in order to get the, a reasonable genetic a reasonable positive yield out of a genetic test you have to pick a sing the right single genetic test for the right patient each time it's hard to do it's a painful process doesn't work very well and this is all based on family history or attributes of the disease onset laterality etc uh, but this is all about going from phenotype to genotype i'm trying to based on phenotype select out the people who may have the genetic disease i'm looking for based on their phenotypic attributes, and then I confirm that or refute that with a genetic test. Genomics has turned that on its head. Our challenge now is how to use the genome. And what we're going to be able to do soon in the future is use genotype to predict phenotype. That is, I'm going to start with a genomic test result, i.e. an MSH2 variant. And I'm going to have that variant start a process with my patient where I will begin to think about the validity of a diagnosis of Lynch syndrome in my patient. And I will do some things with my patient, and inquire about family history, consider some screening tests, etc., all in order to try and find these patients because the flaw of our current approach, and again, this weakness we have of adaptability. We've just gotten totally used to the idea that it, people just have to die of this because it isn't practical to find them before they manifest disease. It is now possible to find these people and identify them as having Lynch syndrome before they're sick or dying of cancer. This is now possible because of the power of genomics. And we need to learn how to harness this tool and use it effectively to prevent unnecessary deaths from preventable diseases. So um, I've given you a lot to chew on here today. Uh, the math, I'm sure some of you don't love math, uh, but uh, I would strongly encourage any of you who have the slightest interest of this to pick up a copy of this book. It's a really quick read. It's a really fun book about Bayes' theorem and some history of the scientific battles uh, that caused frequentist statistics to prevail over the last couple hundred years and how Bayes survived and where it survived intellectually, which is a really interesting story, and some great examples of Bayes' rules, um, things like uh, searching for uh, submarines uh, underwater. Um, I don't know if many of you know the movie The Enigma Code about Alan Turing. Of course, the movie... Um, had lots of uh, featured really well, I think the star of the movie was the the machine um, that he used he created uh, to crack the code but of course it was the conceptual uh, framing of the problem that really cracked it and it was fundamentally Bayesian in its approach and allowed him based on the signature uh, line of the transmission what they deduce had to be the signature line to work backwards in a probabilistic bayesian reasoning function to find code that could match that signature 
and that's really how what the um, the uh, Enigma machine did uh, to crack that code. So um, uh, I will uh, again. I don't get any royalties from this book, anything, of course, uh, but I would encourage you to read it. It's it's really fun. Again, it'll take you to read. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you for your attention. Again, I'm sorry uh, we couldn't be together to meet and discuss this further. I for sure want to thank my teams, both the ClinSeq and the Clinical Sequencing, uh, Clinical Center Genomics Opportunity teams that uh, helped us uh, develop the genomic approaches that we're applying here, and the Clinical uh, Genomics Consortium, ClinGen, that supports uh, the work that's being done uh, internationally to improve uh, variant interpretation and turn uh, the art of variant interpretation into the mathematical science of variant interpretation. And of course, all of you who are uh, taxpayers, uh, thank you for this, your support of the NIH and our program. So uh, I'll stop here and hopefully uh, we can uh, share some uh, question and answer and discussion. I look forward to uh, communicating with you in real time about that. Thanks so much.